Hello and welcome everyone. We are so excited to have Abby Jarvis from QGive with us today to talk about multi-channel fundraising campaigns. Uh, she is here for you today. So at any point during the session, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat. We'll make sure to get to them at the end. Uh, you guys have the advantage of having a really great speaker today to help you with your actual fundraising campaign. So please don't be shy about questions. Uh, before we get going, I did want to chat through a few housekeeping items. We get this question a lot. Yes, today's webinar will be recorded. So if you missed something, don't panic. You can always reference back to the recording. We will also go ahead and send the slides to you after the webinar has concluded today. So again, if you're frantically taking notes and you missed something, don't panic. You'll have all of the resources to reference back. Um, well, also, again, if you have questions, drop them in the chat. Abby is here for you. She wants to help you with what you're working on at your organization. So if you have questions, let us know. We'll be happy to get to them. Also did want to call out that there's lots of free resources available to you to help you with your fundraising goals this year on the Archive website. It's achievecauses.com backslash resources. We actually have a really great 2022 week by week planner. Uh, for end of year giving for 2022 on our website right now. Um, I know we just came off of last year's end of year fundraising, so that might be the last thing on your mind, um, but that is a really great free resource for you that can help you week by week plan your campaign for this year so you're not so stressed when it comes to end of year. So definitely give that a download. It's completely free and available to you. We also do have another webinar coming up next month to help with understanding your nonprofit financial statements. This is a really good session, not just for people within your organization, but if you have any board members that maybe really struggle to understand some of the, the statements you're sharing with them, um, or even newer you know, staff on your team, um, this might be a good session for them. It's completely free in early February. So if that's something you need help with, definitely come back and register with us and, and we'll see you in February. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to Abby. Perfect. Thank you so much. I am excited to talk to you all today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about multi-channel marketing and how you can do it without stressing yourself out. Um, so that said, if you are curious about who I am and why I am talking to you right now, uh, my name is Abby Jarvis. I'm part of the team over at QGive, and my job at QGive is um, to understand fundraising best practices and what donors are looking for and what moves them to donate, and then to put that in brief, understandable presentations so you don't have to do a ton of research about what donors are looking for. So uh, I've been here a little over nine years, and a lot of what I have done at QGIB, in addition to the research and to what donors are kind of looking for, um, is content marketing. So content marketing is something that is increasingly important, especially as your donors start moving onto different channels. So today I'm gonna to cover um, kind of the different channels your donors are frequenting, how you can determine which channels you should be active on and maybe which channels you don't need to be active on. And then I'll also share a lot of content marketing and multi-channel marketing tips that we use at QGIVE that you can use at your organization as well. So if you're not familiar with the term multi-channel marketing, you may wonder what on earth I'm talking about here. And really it's a very long, complicated sounding term that references marketing on lots of different channels at the same time. So um, your multi-channel marketing plans could include any one of these channels, maybe some other ones. Uh, your website and social media are always probably going to be at the top of your priority list when it comes to marketing. Um, but multi-channel marketing also includes things like ranking for SEO search terms, all of your direct mail, any kind of text message communications you have out there. Um, things like brochures and billboards are also considered multi-channel marketing. Um, so your, your marketing stack, the list of channels where you are actually spreading the word about your organization and your mission and the work that you're doing, all of those different channels put together um, will require a multi-channel marketing strategy. So that's what that means. So just out of curiosity, I would love to know what is your most effective fundraising channel? Um, 
Is it your your online channels? Are you really active on social media and get a lot of a lot of fundraising activity there? Um, are you really putting a lot of emphasis on direct mail and print pieces? Uh, go ahead and drop me a line in the chat and let me know where you guys are spending your time. Um, and uh, I'll kind of tailor what I talk about today for you. Um, so as you guys are kind of thinking through that, I want to kind of give you some ideas and some strategies that you can use to choose the channels that, sh that you want to add to your, your marketing strategy. So this is important. I hear a lot of nonprofits, uh, especially fundraising staff and marketing staff who feel like they need to be active on every channel. Uh, and if, even if you don't feel like you need to be active on every channel, sometimes we get over enthusiastic board members whose kid is on TikTok and they really want you to be on TikTok or um, people really want you to, to set up and run a Twitter account, but you don't know if that's necessarily worth your time. So you don't have to be available on every channel. Just put that out there. Uh, what you should be working toward is being active on the channels where you know your donors are spending their time. Uh, no, understanding what your donors are up to and what their preferences are is really important. And then you may be using some channels that aren't really working for you. If you set up a Twitter account because you have that one really vocal board member who really loves Twitter, um, but you're not really getting any traction in your Twitter account, you may be able to retire that channel and spend that time doing something else. Um, and then for some of you, you may have goals that will kind of necessitate moving on to a different channel. Um, if you are looking to engage young volunteers, for example, if you're looking to engage like high school and college students, you may want to jump on Instagram. But if you are trying to attract more baby boomer donors, you don't really need to be on Instagram. Maybe your time would be better spent on Facebook. So those are some things to keep in mind. So the biggest reason this section is so important is because having yourself on too many channels can have some really uh, heart, no, the, the side effects can really be a bummer. So, I mean, you'll, you can burn yourself out. Uh, I know that burnout is one of the biggest issues that, that nonprofit fundraisers face, especially if you're trying to maintain an active presence on fundraising channels that aren't really working for you. Um, it's also hard to do a good job if you are trying to maintain a presence on a platform that doesn't work for you or that you don't particularly like. Um, I, for example, I don't make TikToks. I will never make TikToks. I'm too old to make TikToks and like to be making TikToks. I wouldn't do a good job because I know that it's not something I would wanna do. And it's the same for, for these different fundraising channels. And then the other thing uh, to kind of keep in mind is that if you are working really hard on putting out content on a new channel, but your donors aren't spending time on that channel, you're pouring a lot of time and energy and resources into something that's not kind of giving back to you. So um, as you are kind of establishing what channels you want to use to reach your donors, make sure that the channels you're using are working for you. And I'll kind of go over how to do that in a minute. But here are some common, some common channels and kind of who you're gonna get in touch with. So your website, of course, is going to be uh, one of the biggest assets for you as you're marketing. Andrea commented that um, they really focus on their online presence. So this is gonna be a top priority for you. Uh, I did a really interesting study last year. We released it earlier this year, and we asked donors, so almost 1,300 donors, where they go to look for information about their favorite nonprofits, and the website was the number one place that they went. So you're going to want to keep up your website. That's a channel that's probably going to be in the must-have section for you. Um, it's going to be the hub of your online presence. It's where your donation form is hosted. So uh, as we work through kind of putting together a fundraising strategy and a multi-channel marketing strategy, do be sure that you are putting some emphasis on your website. It's a great place to share your story, especially the story you're using to promote your annual campaign. Um, the one thing that you'll need to keep in mind as you're working on your website is that the information that donors are looking for should be upfront and center, and it should be very easy for them to navigate. So that's one channel. Another really important channel, and I'm curious about this, how many of you are using direct mail to reach out to your donors? 
um, let me know. I have a feeling that Jeremy here is probably active on uh, in the direct mail channel that he they said that uh, their quarterly newsletters and their annual reports are a really big draw for a lot of their donors. So direct mail is certainly something that is still relevant and will remain relevant. Uh, direct mail is still a very, very valuable fundraising channel for a lot of nonprofits, especially if you have donors who are in the baby boomer generation or the greatest generation, so the baby boomers' parents. Um, that said, younger donors also appreciate receiving direct mail. And in a, a session that I led yesterday, uh, a lot of us were kind of comparing notes and we are realizing that younger donors, so I'm a millennial, I'm in this group, uh, Generation X and Gen Z donors increasingly like to see direct mail updates and appeals and then go online to respond to those, those direct mail pieces. So in that case, your donors are interacting with you on two channels. They are reading your message on one channel, so your direct mail, and they're responding on a different channel, your website. So that's fascinating. I'd love to hear if you've kind of seen the same things. Uh, of course, email communications are going to be tremendous, whether you are like Andrea, who's focusing a lot of their effort on, on online channels, or whether you're Jeremy and you are sending quarterly newsletters through, the, through email. This is a really important format for, for fundraising, and uh, there are a couple of caveats here. Emails perform best if they are short and kind of scannable. So uh, what you can do, and I'm gonna walk you through how to create content for some of these channels in a minute, but what you can do is create content for your website and then link that content in your email. So um, go ahead and kind of have a blog article or an important page for a campaign that you're running, reference it in your email, give your readers a little taste of what you're talking about and then link them to your website to read more about it. Uh, that achieves a few different ends. It saves you time. You don't have to put together a whole, a whole email from scratch. And then if you are telling people to visit your website to read more about a story they're very interested in, your donation form is on your website and it is easier for your donors to act upon your appeal uh, if it's just a quick click over to your donation form. Uh, I am curious, how many of you are active on social media? Um, social media is not something that I particularly love doing as an individual, but it is an absolute godsend for fundraisers because around or almost 85% of Americans have a presence on at least one social media channel, um, or at, that's on Facebook, I'm sorry, and that doesn't include other channels. So if you're anything like me, I maintain a presence on at least three social media channels and I'm active on a couple more. So uh, social media is going to be a boon for you. Like I kind of alluded to um, when we were talking about websites, your website uh, is the first place your donors are going to look for information about your nonprofit and your social media channels are a close second. Uh, and uh, if, as a matter of fact, if you're looking to engage younger donors, your social media channels will be the first places your millennial and Gen Z supporters will check. So that said, uh, try to stay active on social media. But I do want to assure you that even though different groups of donors are active on different social media platforms, you don't have to be active on all of them. Figure out kind of where you're getting good engagement and where you are reaching the most people and prioritize those channels. Um, you may also want to choose the different social media channels you use based on the groups of people you wanna connect with. Baby boomer donors are the largest group, well, baby boomers, not necessarily donors, but baby boomers are the most active group on social media if you're using Facebook. Um, if you're looking to connect with Generation X, they also maintain a pretty decent presence on Facebook. Instagram may be better and more effective for you if you're looking to connect with millennial and Generation Z donors. Twitter users are a very specific group of people. Facebook users are looking for different kinds of posts. So do a little bit of research, maybe talk to some of your, uh, your donors that you have a good relationship with and ask them where they'd like to spend their time online. So uh, you are gonna want to be present on social media and then you might wanna do a little bit of research into which channels you wanna spend your time updating. Uh, I'm also curious to see how many of you are actively sending text message communications. 
Um, this is something that is kind of new for a lot of nonprofits, but it is something that's becoming increasingly popular with donors, particularly young donors. Uh, and the reason that this is kind of something that a lot of nonprofits are moving toward is because of the response rate. Now, I don't know about you all. The, I read that the average American receives 212 emails every day. I certainly get more than that, and you probably get more than that. Uh, so the odds of one of our fundraising emails getting lost in someone's inbox, whether it's accidentally deleted or whether it's moved into the promotions tab in Gmail, which often happens to me, uh, the open rates for your emails are probably going to be between 20 and maybe 30, 35%. And that's, that's on a good day. Um, that's where, where my email open rates hover. My email open rates usually hover between 30 and 33%. Text message open rates, however, are 90% within the first three minutes of being sent. It bumps up to 98% within the first five minutes of you sending that communication. So if you are actively reaching out to your donors using text messages, you can expect very high open rates. Now, that's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, it is a very effective communication rate, but it can also quickly become irritating. Um, I don't know about some of you all. I have certainly signed up for promo codes or something through my phone or through a text message and then gotten frustrated because I'll get a text message every day or every other day from the company that I was trying to interact with. Um, and then I quickly opt out of those text messages. So if you do decide to add texting to your, your kind of multi-channel marketing plan, be intentional about when you're using text messages to communicate with your donors. Um, text messages are intensely powerful, especially if you have an urgent need or if you are kind of dealing with a crisis situation. Uh, some of you may remember the uh, Red Cross campaigns that heavily relied on text fundraising. Um, it's a great example of an instance where it was a crisis response incident. Uh, they had an urgent need and they really wanted donors to take immediate action. If you ever find yourself in a position uh, that that kind of suits your fundraising campaign, text, fundraiser, or text communications may be a good channel for you to explore. So if you are kind of planning your 2022 fundraising strategy and you want to make sure you're active on the right channels, here are some questions you can ask yourself. Um, you, you'll want to ask yourself these questions toward the beginning of your fundraising strategy planning. Uh, so ask yourself, where do your donors engage with you the most? Um, if you are on Facebook and you have donors that respond to every question, love every update, share your pictures and get excited about what you're doing there, keep active on, on Facebook. If you have a Twitter channel that is not really getting any engagement and you kind of feel like you're just shouting into the ether, it is okay for you to retire that channel and spend your effort somewhere else. Uh, ask yourself what channels have been successful in the past and prioritize those in your upcoming strategy. So if you always have a dynamite response to your direct mail campaigns, keep that in 2022. Um, but then ask yourself if you also have channels that are not working for you, or if they are working for you, if they're not really giving you the results that you want. Um, if you, for example, are using Twitter and you're not getting the engagement you're looking for, you may want to ask yourself, well, can I do anything differently on Twitter? Uh, can I post at a different time of day? Can I use different hashtags? Can I change my, my posting cadence? And then if you kind of work through those questions and decide that you can't kind of get your Twitter up to where you want to, it's absolutely okay to retire that channel. Um, I will say, if you decide to retire a channel, it is best for you to delete that account. Um, so the reason I say that is because a lot of younger donors will look at a channel. So if I stumble upon your Twitter channel and you haven't updated Twitter since December of 2019, um, I perceive that negatively. Young donors perceive that negatively. So it's better to deactivate and delete an account than it is to just let it sit there without updating it. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> Here's kind of an example of what this can look like. So um, Lakeland Food Pantry decided that they wanted to revamp their multi-channel marketing campaign and their strategy for 2022. They're going to keep direct mail 
uh, direct mail always works for them. They're going to continue to send out the direct mail pieces that they have done in the past. They're going to keep email and Facebook. Um, they get a lot of engagement there. They get great response rates. Um, they will spend time on Instagram because it's a good way for them to engage with people, but they don't raise a lot of money through Instagram. So if that's the case for you, you may want to do what Lakeland Food Pantry did and make sure that you're emphasizing engagement, but not putting a ton of appeals out there. If you are going to put appeals out there, they're going to be very intentional about how they phrase them. And they're going to tailor those appeals to the groups of people they know are engaging with them. And then in this case, I don't know why I'm picking on Twitter. It's not my favorite channel, but in this hypothetical situation, Twitter has never been successful for them. So they're not going to prioritize that. They're going to get rid of that channel and they're going to focus their efforts on the channels that are working for them. <clears throat> now, so you've kind of gotten a feel at this point for what your donors are doing online. Uh, you maybe understand where they're spending their time and what channels will work for you. The next step is understanding what donors like in terms of the content that you're posting. So I want to put this caveat out there. A multi-channel marketing campaign will include lots of different kinds of content and understanding what kinds of content inspire your donors to get involved is going to be very important. So here's what this can look like. So before you start really planning out your campaign, before you start planning what blog articles you're going to write, or what posts you're going to make, or what pages on your website you're going to update, get a feel for the kinds of content your donors are already excited about seeing. Um, this will help you accomplish a few things. One, it will help you uh, as you write your content, you'll understand um, what's engaging, what's exciting, what's inspiring, and you'll skip the content that hasn't moved people before. Um, Skipping that content means you're going to save time and stress, uh, and it will also kind of give you a little emotional or mental boost. Um, if you post a blog, or I'll even say this, if I post a blog article that people love, I get so excited about my next blog article that I'm going to write. If we share a blog article on QGive social media channels that I wrote and nobody engages with it, it's a huge bummer, and I don't want to write those kinds of blog articles anymore. So take a look back at your most popular posts. Look at the posts on Facebook that have gotten the best engagement. Look at the blog articles that have inspired the most donations. Look at the emails that have performed best and really moved your donors to respond well. And find the common elements in those, those different content marketing pieces and kind of keep them in mind as you plan the content for 2022. So, here are some questions that you can kind of ask yourself as you plan the content you're going to create. What, which of your past appeals have been the most successful? Um, that can be direct mail, it can be email, it can be entire campaigns if you are running your, your appeal on different channels. Um, take a look at the stories that you're telling that really get your donors excited. Take a look at specific pieces of content. Uh, so at QGive, we have a series, a blog series that has been wildly popular and we emulate those, that style of blog um, on, our, on our website all the time. You can do the same thing. Take a look at what pieces of content have performed well and prioritize creating content kind of in the same style or the same vein. And then take a look at the different engagement strategies you're using. Um, an engagement strategy in this case could be if you are... Um, active on Facebook and you're posting a lot of polls, if your donors love polls, prioritize creating more. Um, if you've noticed that you have sent out surveys, uh, maybe after an event, and your donors have really loved kind of giving you their feedback and ideas, add more surveys to your 2022 content marketing program. Um, taking the time to kind of do some research into what your donors like and engage with can be very eye-opening and can be a great kind of guiding light as you plan your content marketing plan. Uh, so once you've identified some, some popular pieces of content or some popular styles of content, you can start putting together a plan for the kinds of content you're going to create in 2022. So common themes may stick out to you, common post types may stick out to you, 
Um, you may notice that posts that you share on specific dates or times may be uh, very, really effective. Kind of an example of that, um, if you get emails from QGIF, you'll notice that you almost always get those emails on Tuesdays and Thursdays, because we've noticed that that's when our audiences are more likely to engage with us. So really any trends or patterns you can identify um, in your content performance will help you as you plan future content. Here's what this looks like uh, in practice. So SPCA Florida is a, a nonprofit that's in my hometown. They have an absolutely wild online fundraising um, program and they have a highly engaged audience. So these are two of their most popular posts from the last few months. Um, and you'll notice that both of these posts have a few things in common. One, they're written from the perspective of a dog. I don't know if you can read the content on these, though. they're kind of small screenshots, but both of these posts are written from the dog's perspective. Both of them feature pictures of very happy looking dogs. You'll notice that neither of these have dogs that look sad or mistreated. Um, and they were both posted in the morning. So I don't know if you can see the timestamps. One was posted at 9.33 in the morning. The other was posted at 9.15 in the morning. These two posts performed extremely well. So you can make some, some deductions about the kind of content that these donors like. They like happy, uplifting content. They like posts that are written from the dog's perspective and they're active in the late morning. So what you can do is compare some posts. So this is a post that the SPCA made. Um, it's a request for newspaper uh, that they wanted to use to house train their pets. Uh, in this post, the request for newspapers comes from staff members. Uh, the image that they used is a stock photo and it got 23 likes and 30 shares, which is a pretty good ratio, honestly. But look what they did. Uh, in this other post, they applied what they learned from those two happy puppy posts I shared a minute ago. They have the same appeal. It's a request for newspapers that they'll use to house train puppies, but they applied the, the trends and the patterns that they noticed in their donor behavior. In this case, the request comes from a shelter puppy the images of a real shelter puppy, not a, not a stock photo. And it was posted around the same time, but it got 168 likes and 167 shares. It was much more successful than the previous post. There was nothing wrong with the previous post, but SPCA Florida identified patterns and what makes their donors happy and inspires them to get involved. They applied those patterns to the same kind of post and it performed much better. So when I talk about looking at your donors preferences and patterns this is this is what that can look like um, and if you do it well and you really hit upon what moves your donors you can get absolutely phenomenal results the third tip i want to talk to you about so we've looked at understanding what our donors um, are doing online or what they're doing when they're checking their mailbox or what they're doing when they're looking at their phones We've under, we understand how to identify the trends and patterns in content that donors like. So now your job is to create the content that's gonna move them on all those different channels. Now that can be very intimidating, especially if you've identified lots of channels that your donors are interested in using. So what you can do is emphasize creating versatile content that you can use on multiple channels multiple times. And this is how you do that. This is my favorite part of this presentation because these are things I have to do every day. So what you wanna do is keep in mind that you are busy and your time is very valuable. And so you wanna get the most possible work out of the, the content you're producing. So you're gonna to wanna to prioritize creating content that can be used on all of the channels that you're, you're keeping up to date and that hopefully you can use multiple times. So if you do this, you might spend two hours putting together a blog article, but if you can share that blog article five or six times over the lifetime of that, that article, your work will go a lot further than if you only share it one time. The other thing that this does is, especially if you are sharing some messaging or a piece of content on multiple channels, that signals a few things to your donors. Your donors are gonna be more likely to remember and act upon your messaging. 
and they're going to be more likely to trust you. So if you want to, here's an example. Um, if you, if Andrea has prioritized being online, she has a story on her homepage about her campaign. That story is echoed in a blog article. That blog article gets shared to social media a few times. It is linked in an email newsletter. It's linked in an appeal. You're, the odds that your donors are going to remember that story and act upon it are much higher than if they only saw that story one time. Uh, the other cool thing is that this makes your, uh, your job <laughs> a lot easier. If you are using a blog article five or six times before you retire it from being posted, um, you're doing less work than if you were trying to post a different blog article five or six times. So you can really fill a content calendar with a, a min, not a small amount of work. I mean, content creation is still work, but you can use that content a lot and get a lot of mileage out of it. <clears throat> so ask yourself what content pieces you can create that will get a lot of, a lot of work done for you. So what assets do you create that takes a ton of time? If you're Jeremy, you probably spend a lot of time on your mid-year and your annual reports. So ask yourself which of those or which pieces of those reports can you share on lots of different channels? Can you make a blog article out of the content in your report? Can you make an infographic? Can you include it in an appeal? Can you use it to reinforce a different appeal? Um, there are all kinds of opportunities to really get creative with how you're sharing the content you're making. So here are some, some practical ways that you can do this. So if you are very active on Facebook and you write uh, long update statuses, what you could do instead is instead of writing a long update status, create a blog article that's about as long that includes all the same update pieces, but then you share that blog article on Facebook, uh, on Instagram, in your email newsletter, in other places. So it doesn't just live on Facebook, it lives on your website and you can spread that many more places. Uh, if you stream live video, it's a really powerful engagement tool, but you could try creating a video and hosting it on YouTube and then sharing that video on multiple channels. So it's the same amount of work, but you are getting your video in front of other donors that may be not active on Facebook or wherever you're streaming that video. Um, if you are, if you post a lot of images online, which is wonderful, I hope you do, um, try setting up a photo shoot and getting a large bank of images that you can use throughout the year instead of running around the office trying to figure out who has a photo or who can take a photo that will kind of fit your campaign. Um, this is something we do at QGive all the time. Um, and we have a, a bank of photos on our shared drive that we can all access at any time if we need a good, a good photo. And then uh, for those of you who are sending out quarterly newsletters and reports and are really emphasizing your email communications, uh, try instead of creating a whole bunch of original content for your newsletter, try maybe creating one or two original pieces. But other than that, um, linking your donors to blog articles or resources that are hosted on your website that they may not have seen yet. Uh, all of these strategies, if you kind of, if you put them into practice, can save you a lot of time. It can get more people uh, looking and, and absorbing your messaging, and then uh, it can help you be more effective because you're getting a lot of mileage out of a single marketing asset. So here are some examples of what that looks like. So these examples are coming from our friends over at Mercy Ships, um, and they put together uh, the story of a little girl named Gamai, and this is how they created a single piece of very versatile content. Uh, so they told Gamai's story on their webpage. Uh, these are some, some screenshots from their website. They also put together a YouTube video, or I guess this is technically, I think it's hosted on Vimeo. They put together a video that they hosted on their page, and you're going to see that they were able to get a ton of mileage out of this one single page. Uh, so here's a bigger screenshot of Gamaya's page. Uh, they also built a donation form that featured her story. So they took all of these photos at once, they had a bank of photos that they could use to reinforce their appeal, and they put together this beautiful website. What they did then is they used that same bank of images and they posted on their different social media channels. 
Um, you'll notice <laughs> that they're on Facebook here, they're on Instagram over here, and they're active on Twitter over here. You may also notice that uh, some of the language that they're using is very similar across different posts. All of that language is lifted almost verbatim from the actual website that they set up. And uh, they are reaching lots of different audiences on lots of different channels using content that they created and hosted on a single page. So they did a great job of creating versatile content they can use on lots of channels without stressing themselves out. Uh, so some other kind of bonus things you can do is as you're telling stories on your website, as you're sharing them on Facebook, through your newsletters, through different emails, and even through direct mail, is you can add some of those storytelling elements to your donation form. What that does is it reiterates the story that your donors are connecting to and are being inspired by and it reminds them kind of subtly when they land on your donation form that the reason that they're on your donation form in the first place is because you've inspired them with this beautiful story. So your story is spread all over your different channels and it is reiterated on your donation form. You can take it even a step further if you'd like, and this may suit your campaign, it may not. Uh, you may want to even try setting up suggested donation amounts that you reinforce with pictures from your campaign. Um, something to experiment with, something to try, certainly something we're seeing working very successfully for some of our nonprofits. So as you are putting this all together, I would encourage you to keep an eye on your different marketing channels performances, because the next step as you're kind of working your way through 2022 and your marketing efforts is kind of taking, a, taking some time to look at how your content is performing on your different channels and tweaking it to see if you can get it to perform a little better. So here's what that looks like. <clears throat> so once you've kind of wrapped up your campaign, or if you're running a year long campaign, like if your 2022 annual campaign is really focusing on a specific story or even a theme, uh, take some time uh, every month or two to evaluate instead of waiting for the end of the year. But as you kind of look over your different um, post performances, ask yourself some questions. Are you reaching your goals? That can be anything from, um, are you engaging your donors? Are you engaging the type of donors you want to engage? Are your donors donating as a result of your communications? Uh, and then ask yourself, what's working? And how can you emulate what's working in future posts or content? And then ask yourself if you can change anything next time. If you notice that your emails aren't getting the open rates you're looking for, can you try experimenting with sending on a different date and time? If your Facebook appeals aren't working as well as you'd like, can you change um, the format that you're sharing? Could you maybe try posting more pictures or could you post video or could you post something else that catches your donor's eye? And then ask yourself, in the next round of content that you create, what can you do a little differently to see if it moves the needle? And one thing that I know I struggle with and that a lot of other nonprofits struggle with is uh, the idea of something not going well and then just kind of letting it go. Uh, but I did want to encourage you all, if you are, especially if you're exploring new channels in your multi-channel marketing uh, strategies, it's okay to retire those if they're not working for you. If you really want to be active on Instagram or something and it's just not working for you and you can't figure it out, it, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just your donor's preferences. You don't have to be active on that channel if you don't want to. All right. And then as you are kind of taking some time to review your performance, use the trends and patterns that you've identified as you review to set yourself up for success in the future. Mimic what worked for you. If you notice like SPCA, that pictures of your clients looking really happy is more effective than stock photos or even pictures that have a sadder kind of tone to them. Mimic the happy pictures, include more of those in your plan. Uh, tweak what maybe didn't work and see if you can salvage it. And then if you've noticed that a, a form or a, a post type or a channel or even a date and time doesn't work for you, you can cut that out. You don't have to keep what's not working for you. 
And then one thing that you can do too is kind of refine your audience. If you are making a lot of effort to reach out to Generation Z donors and it's just not working out for you, maybe evaluate the kind of Generation Z donor or the Gen Z even volunteer that you want to attract and see if you can tweak your content to reach the donors or supporters you're looking to engage. Um, the very fun and often frustrating thing about content marketing is that there is often no right answer or no silver bullet. It's a lot of experimentation and iteration and evaluation. Uh, and as you kind of work through those cycles, you'll definitely start to move the needle and engage more of your supporters. Now, I talked to you for 43 minutes about multi-channel marketing, how to identify the channels your donors are using, and um, how to create content that you can use in lots of different ways. That all said, do any of you have questions that I can answer for you uh, about this particular style of communication? Um, someone did ask, can they get the slides? Yes, uh, you, the slides and the recording will be made available to you after um, the webinar. Uh, Maurice asked, do you recommend any sites that they can use for content marketing? <clears throat> um, and the answer is probably. It depends on the kind of content marketing you want to do. Um, if you are looking to manage multiple channels, uh, especially if you're looking at using multiple social media channels, there are some tools available to you that you can use to, to do that. Um, one that I know is really popular with a lot of nonprofits is um, Hootsuite. And Sprout Social also has popped up uh, a lot. Using those, uh, those tools can give you some really cool insight into uh, what content is performing and which groups of donors you're reaching. Now that said, um, I know that there is a need for free or low cost tools. So what I would encourage you to do if you are using Facebook, which I kind of think most of you are, are any of you not using Facebook? I'm just curious. Um, if you're using Facebook uh, and you're using the business.facebook.com tool, which you are if you're using a Facebook page, I would encourage you to keep an eye on your insights. So your insights can show you uh, your, your audience demographics, which is really important. Um, so Maurice, if you know that the primary person that likes your nonprofit's Facebook page is a woman in her 40s, you're going to speak to them a little differently than you would if your primary audience were men in their 70s. Um, I'd also encourage you to look at some free tools online that can help you out. Um, so if you're sending emails, for example, you may want to work toward boosting your open rates. There are uh, subject line like review tools. I know CoSchedule has a cool one. Uh, you plug in your, your email subject line and the service will make suggestions like, hey, you use this word and that word tends to have a negative impact on open rates. You could try using this word instead. Um, I use those all the time, highly recommended. Uh, if you have a need for graphics in your content marketing, I would try something like Canva. Canva has a free options for nonprofits that you can use to design your own graphics. So if you have a blog article with a really cool statistic or something in there that you want to share, uh, you can put together a really pretty graphic in Canva for free and then share that on your different channels. Um, someone asked, or Andrew asked, what if the content that gets good engagement does not really align with your mission? Um, so I may have a follow-up question to that. I am kind of curious what content you're creating that doesn't align with your mission. Um, because if you, I can help you like work through maybe what aspect of that, uh, content will, is working with your donors. Um, so I'm trying to think. Maybe if you're doing something like asking, uh, here's an example. Here's something that I did when I was brand new and working in social media and then that I discovered that I hate working in social media. I don't do it anymore. Um, I noticed that one type of post that got a lot of engagement was we were at QGIVE and uh, we were 
we used to do lunch together every Friday. And one week we asked our Facebook audience to vote on where the QGIF team was going to go for lunch. We had a weird amount of engagement, like more engagement on that than we did on any other post. It was a very engaging post. It didn't really align with our, our marketing strategy. But what I could take from that is that it wasn't necessarily people caring about uh, where the QGIV team ate lunch that day. What they wanted was they wanted an opportunity to interact with the QGIV team and kind of have a, a voice there. So we started asking more questions, uh, not about lunch, but about, uh, about more uh, fundraising content. If you notice maybe that you are generating content that um, is maybe very picture heavy, but the pictures don't really align with what you're trying to get your donors to think and talk about, uh, try putting together a photo set that does kind of draw more attention to your work or to your, um, your clients. I hope that's what you were looking for. Uh, if I'm totally off base, let me know and I will revise my answer. Okay, good. That did help. That's what I was really hoping to hear. Awesome. Oh, and one, I didn't include this in this presentation, but I wanted to share it with you all. If you catch yourself totally stuck and you just don't, you are having a hard time identifying where your, your audiences are spending their time or what they like to, to read or look at or think about, uh, I would highly suggest putting together a survey that you can send out, maybe not to all of your donors, but to your most loyal donors, the most engaged ones. And you can just ask them, what social media channels do you use? Where would you like to engage with us? What kind of content would you like me to share with you? Do you want more stories? Do you want financial reports? Do you want videos? Do you want something else? Um, if you play your cards right and you present that survey as an opportunity for donors to have their preferences met, donors are very forthcoming about what they want from their relationship with you. So if you get stuck at any point, try a survey. And if you don't really know if you want to do that, try sitting down with your ideal donor. So if you have a donor that has been supporting your nonprofit for years and years, uh, try asking them what they're looking for. And similarly, if you are trying to engage in a group of, of people and you don't know how, try talking to one of the people from that group. So if you wanted to engage millennials, I, sit down with someone like me who is a millennial and is online and ask them what they're looking for. Uh, if you want to understand what moves your major donors, ask your major donors what kind of information they're looking for and which channels they are using to look for that information. Um, so you don't have to, this doesn't have to totally be a guessing game. You don't have to rely entirely on Facebook insights or email open rates. Uh, you can also sit down and ask your supporters what they want. And that will, one, let you know what other donors and supporters want. Uh, but it also gives you the opportunity to kind of build a relationship with your, your most loyal donors. Anything else I can help with? All right. Well, Erica, do you want to say anything as we kind of wrap things up? Nope, I was just going to say thank you so much, Abby, for being here. And again, if anybody has any questions, drop them in the chat. Otherwise, Abby, thank you so much for all of your great insights. Um, and we'll definitely send out the slides and the recording to everybody. So if you missed something, don't worry. You can always reference it back. Definitely. And if you come up with any questions or anything, uh, you can always email me or uh, you can reach out to social or reach out to QGive on really any of our social channels and uh, we'll get you an answer to your question. So let us know if we can help. All right, everyone, I think that's okay. it for today. Have a great Wednesday. Thanks for letting me talk to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Abby. Have a good one, everyone.